Great. Well, hello everyone. Uh, happy Friday and Saturday, wherever you are in the world. Uh, thank you for joining us on, the, on this, uh, you know, here with the International Ocean Film Festival. Uh, my name is Nicole Esther, and I'll be your moderator for this lovely Q and A uh, question, Q and A session on uh, mangrove restoration. Um, I am very happy to be joined by our panelists today. Um, and I'm going to give them space to talk about their, their story and their journeys uh, one by one, but um, I'm, I'm happy to be joined by, by Leo Thorne, um, by uh, Dr. Jennifer Howard, by Dr. Gretchen Kaufman, um, by uh, J uh, Jim Enright, and, um, and I think myself, Nicole Esters. We're going to be having a, a conversation about, um, about their experience and related to and uh, mango restoration from around the world. And first we're gonna start off with um, with Leo. And if you can kind of introduce yourself and tell us, you know, out of all the issues that are facing marine and ocean and coastal ecosystems, you chose mangroves. How did you get there? Hi, Nicole, thanks for the intro and hello everyone. My name's Leo. I'm I'm a wildlife filmmaker based in the in the UK and I'm also the creative director for the Mangrove Action Project. So but to be honest you know, me and mangroves, it was totally unplanned. It was an accidental coming together. Um, I don't have a science degree, you know, I'm not a marine biologist. I was a landscape architect, sort of working and living in London, far away from any mangrove, not a mangrove in sight. Um, and embarrassingly, and, until my sort of mid twenties, you know, I didn't even know what a, what a mangrove forest was. So that was, yeah, a bit embarrassing, but you know, it really wasn't on people's minds. No one was talking about them. And I remember back in the day, sort of watching the first Planet Earth's Blue Planets, um, mangroves were maybe mentioned, but you know, it really wasn't featured like it was now. So that's that's really great. Um, it was back in 2011 when I got the opportunity to, to work in Southeast Asia. And I sort of decided I wanted to get more involved in conservation, the natural world. Um, and that's when I, you know, started look, looking, researching local projects. Um, you know, I was passionate about conservation and that's when I came across the Mangrove Action Project uh, and, and mangroves pretty much for the first time. So the more I found out about them, the more I realized, you know, how important they are, um, how critical they are in our fight for climate, climate breakdown and our future um, as coastal protectors, you know, for storing more carbon than inland rainforests, for acting as nurseries for so much of our marine life. Um, and for providing, you know, livelihoods for hundreds of millions of coastal people, um, you know, so the, the, the list really goes on and they're so fascinating, you know, um, this forest that's been able to adapt to live in two totally opposite worlds, um, you know, so dynamic, constantly changing from, from night to day, you know, with the tides coming in and out. Um, and because of this, you get such a rich biodiversity across different countries, regions, you know, the wildlife contained within them, everything from all the little fish, you know, uh, and crabs to, to Bengal tigers living in, you know, the largest mangrove forest in, in India. Um, so, and, 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 and also the different relationships that people have with, with their forests um, and how they rely on them. So I think it was that sort of diversity that really, really drew me to mangroves and, and the fact that they're so, so undervalued and, you know, still really threatened and, and misunderstood, I think, um, in so many parts of the world. And that's, that's sort of what's been sort of inspiring me, I guess, to, um, to, to make videos and tell stories about them. Yeah. That's great to hear. So, you know, Leo, your, your film, Restoring the Natural Mangrove Forest, takes us on a trip to, to Thailand and, and, and we meet Jim and we meet the Mangrove Action uh, Project and we learn about, you know, all the fantastic work that you're doing. And, and uh, you know, for those of you who haven't seen the film, first of all, you should see it. Um, and second of all, you'll, if you have seen it, you will you recognize Jim uh, from the film. And so Jim, can, if you can you know, tell us about your experience, tell us about Mangrove Action Project, your, you know, all the work that you're doing and, and, um, and kind of your approach, the, the organization's approach to, to mangrove restoration. Thank you. Um, I'm Jim Enright and I'm based here in Trung in Southern Thailand. It's on the Andaman Sea coast of Thailand. Um, I came to Thailand in 1992 as a volunteer, and I was uh, working in a national park, Thailand's first coastal national park called Khao Samriat. 
and uh, it had mangroves and literally there were mangroves two meters outside my back door. Um, and so I had an opportunity to observe and learn about mangroves. And it was at the time where shrimp farming was just really booming in Southeast Asia, all around the park. And even within the park, there were shrimp farms uh, being constructed. And it was just really devastating for the, for the mangroves um, at that time. And it was very, it was a very hot issue. There were, you know, confrontations. It was, you know, violence uh, even associated with it uh, at that time. Um, so I got to learn and really sort of became interested in mangroves because they are so unique and uh, seeing them every day um, uh, was, you know, I, I really got a feel for them. But it wasn't until um, 2000 when I became involved with the Mangrove Action Project and we set up an office here in, uh, in Thailand. Um, and it was really before um, the Indian Ocean tsunami of 2004, MAP was really strictly focused on education, raising awareness about mangroves, the threats to mangroves, particularly shrimp aquaculture. Um, but really the tsunami 2004 um, was a big change, changing point for many things. But we, I personally noticed after the tsunami, huge amounts of planting going on, uh, not only here in Thailand, but throughout the region, India, Sri Lanka. Um, and much of this was totally failure. Um, statistics, some statistics say 70 to 80% uh, of failure. So it's at that point, I said to myself, like, so much money is being wasted, so many resources, people's time, there's got to be a better way. And we got in touch with Robin Lewis, who was based in Florida, um, who had been working with mangroves for 30, 40 years at that time. And he had a very different approach to restoring mangroves. And it focused on um, restoring hydrology to mangroves, looking at the causes of why the mangroves were lost. And if you repair those, let nature do what it does best and allow nature to replant the, the, the mangroves. And that's the approach that MAP, MAP has taken. We call it community-based ecological mangrove restoration. Unlike Florida, we add a community because communities are central. And if you watch the video, you'll see how the role of communities, they have to be involved, just not as stakeholders, as we would say, but they, they have to be totally involved in making decisions and have really ownership of what goes on. So that's, uh, in a nutshell, our, our approach. It's very unconventional. It goes against all the forestry government practices. And so it's a very uphill battle for us to uh, try to convince governments, people, organizations that um, um, mangroves can restore themselves if we deal with the problems, which are often, often social issues. Um, and there can be as I say, physical problems. But that's um, how we've approached it. And I will be able to talk more to that later. Thank you. Thanks, Jim. So, you know, your, your point about collaborating with the communities that actually live there, that are, you know, impacting, that are, that are you know, um, uh, in, that are impacted by and are impacting the mangrove e ecosystems is, is really critical. And, and that idea of collaboration, that idea of talking to others. And so, you know, I'd love to switch over, you know, from going to a community um, in Thailand to, you know, global forums to, to having to the issue of, you know, talking to multiple governments, as you said, uh, Jim, to, to Dr. Dr. Jen and Jennifer Howard. So, I, I, you know, you, you work at the UN level, you work the, at the global level, at the policy level with other organizations that are all dealing with that. How do you navigate that space? Yeah, hi, thanks, Nicole. And uh, just as um, an introduction, I'm the uh, blue, um, the senior director of our Blue Carbon Program at Conservation International, which sits within our Center for Nature-Based Solutions, where we're really looking at how does nature um, provide 30% of our climate solution. Uh, 
under the Paris Agreement. And so mangroves and coastal ecosystems are a critical component of how nature is being utilized to combat climate change. And you know, to answer your question, I think that one thing that CI has really um, excelled in Conservation International is really over the last 10 years or so, really building the science behind the um, ways in which mangroves and coastal ecosystems can protect communities against storm surges, you know, provide alternative livelihoods as well as food security, but then also um, the science around the climate mitigation value that they provide. And then we've sort of taken that science and done a lot of translation into how to make that policy relevant. So when you're looking at these international policy and governing bodies, what is the information that they need in order to move forward to incentivize conservation and restoration of these ecosystems to meet international targets? And so through that work, we've done a lot with uh, the UNFCCC, which is the body that sort of helps to uh, implement and monitor countries' agreements under the Paris Agreement and worked with countries individually on their nationally determined contributions. So every country is able to come up with how they are going to address climate change in a way that best suits their circumstance. And having coastal ecosystems integrated into that for uh, their blue carbon value, that's the carbon that's stored and sequestered within those systems, is something that we've worked very uh, closely with several governments on, including uh, Costa Rica, Kenya, Indonesia, Philippines, and others. And we're seeing a lot of excitement around this inclusion of these ecosystems into those uh, plans. And the other thing that we're really working on is, and I think everybody on the panel would agree, that restoring or conserving a mangrove is really a no regrets strategy. So yes, you can do it and try to utilize those activities to meet climate targets, but simultaneously, you're also going to be meeting targets under the conservation for um, biodiversity because of the biodiversity that those ecosystems bring with them. You're also going to be meeting targets under your sustainable development goals because they you know, will clean the water from pollution. They provide livelihoods that are respectable, um, food security, and um, in a lot of cases, uh, mangroves are critical, especially for women who do a lot of the fishing and, and the work within intact mangrove areas. So helping governments realize that by doing this one activity, conserving and restoring mangroves, uh, you're able to meet multiple targets across all of your commitments in one, in one thing. And therefore, it becomes a win-win-win. I think a no-brainer for these countries to really uh, emphasize and put mangroves and coastal systems into their management plans. Um, there are other activities that CI has really been doing um, at the global scale. And I'll mention one here and we can get into others as we move on. But the Global Mangrove Alliance is something that CI helped to found along with IUCN, the Nature Conservancy, WWF, and um, Wetlands International, but now has grown to over 25 uh, NGOs, international NGOs, and academic partners. Mangrove Action Project is one of our more active members in that, which is really great to have. And that group has really come together around this idea of wanting to increase the amount of mangrove on the planet. And we do that in three ways. One is halting ongoing mangrove loss. So a lot of those shrimp farms that um, are, have been established, you know, figuring out ways to do sustainable production without uh, increasing mangrove loss. Science-based restoration, again, that kind of restoration that uh, Jim talked about um, that is built on first firmly the scientific way to do it correctly, and then bringing that to communities and governments to scale, as well as public awareness. And we're looking at how the Global Mangrove Alliance as a whole can have both direct impact on mangrove areas through you know, actually funding and working there versus uh, creating enabling conditions through some of the policy mechanisms I just mentioned. Great, thanks, thanks Jen. Um, Gretchen, are you there? Almost. It's about to work. Are you ready? Okay. Um, so, so everyone, uh, I will also like to welcome uh, Dr. I'm at the university. Sorry, guys. And uh, they, it's it's still basically Friday night for us, and they 
they uh the internet's not great it's when they work no. on everything <laughs> no problem it happens <laughs> right before we started i had my own technical difficulties so so you totally understandable um but yes yeah, so, so we wanted to to give you a chance to introduce yourself can you guys see me yet oh yo, yes no. yes can you hear can you hear me i think it might be a delay okay hopefully this is it Gretchen, can you hear me? Hey. Yes. <laughs> can you hear me? You can I hear can hear me? You. Yes. Yeah. All right. Sorry, everyone. <laughs> I'm <right> here. <laughs> and sorry. Sorry, Jim. It's even earlier for you in Thailand. Um, so what was the question, Nicole? Yes. Yeah. So, so um, we, you know, we started off with Leo and he was telling us how we, how he even got to, to mangroves, you know, growing up in the UK and, you know, and kind of going on his own journey. We, we then kind of went to Jim, who's, uh, who pops up in the film and he talked about his experience and his journey and, and the, the mangrove action project and their approach and the work in Thailand. And we went from, um, from a local on the ground community kind of perspective to, to Jen's perspective, working at the at the UN level and how that kind of connects to, to, to international targets, to national targets. Um, and so we wanted to also, I wanted to kind of shift and think about, you know, you work at a, you, you know, you're, you're a lecturer, you're a professor at, at, uh, at, the, at, a, at the National um, University in Singapore. And, you know, you're looking at academics, you're looking at academia, you're also teaching the next generation of people that are gonna be dealing with this issue. And so I wanted to kind of hear from you you know, what is it that you're kind of working on your own journey, your own, your own uh, experience in, in, in restoration and in mangroves and wetland restoration? Thanks, Nicole. Um, so my career has been based around ecological or ecosystem restoration. Um, I started in college in the 90, 80s. <laughs> <laughs> um, and so my journey has been um, being landlocked growing up in Georgia to a dream of being back here in Borneo, uh, in Malaysia, Singapore, Thailand, wherever um, there are mangroves at the coast. Um, because in Georgia, we have salt marshes, we don't have mangroves. And in, San Francis in the San Francisco Bay, you guys, we have salt marshes. Um, there's simply not enough rain in the tropics. There's so much rain that that presents um, a possibility for forested wetlands. Um, and so I'm excited that I got to move over here during the pandemic eight months ago to start working more on restoration of mangroves. So um, there's so much more in between, but I think that what I wanted to say to introduce myself even more is I, I've been, like I said, working in rest as a restoration ecologist and research, but I also started off the first 20 years of my career by doing restoration. I was a practitioner um, like Jim, and I've always worked with communities. So I'm, I have a huge focus on community-based restoration and involving my students um, wherever we are in restoration. And um, here in Singapore, we have lots of wetlands and mangroves. So we've been kayaking and getting to know the wetlands because if you can't inspire students in the next generation to care and to know that there's an issue, um, then you can't actually uh, change the world to do community-based restoration. And so um, I guess that's my role now as an educator. Um, and I just finished my semester grading in the wee hours last night. Um, so it's fresh in my head that what we need to do is not just involve the community um, and hear the students in my community with the community wherever the mangroves are in Southeast Asia or around the world. Um, but we have to do that in a significant way in the next 10 years. It's the UN decade of ecosystem restoration. I'm not sure if you meant, any of you guys mentioned that, but that's my goal as a practitioner, as an educator, is to rethink how we can do a better job because we haven't been doing a good job, just like I'm sure Jim said, um, they've been um, working on ecosystem-based mangrove restoration now. Um, and that is important in any ecosystem. So we need to do, we need to engage, engage the local communities, engage 
people from all around the world, however we can, on the Tree app, on Escocia, on whatever we can do to get people around the world during this pandemic involved. Then we have to somehow do this on a much larger scale. So that's my new field of restoration biogeography. And, and then we have to monitor it and not just ourselves as scientists. This is the big problem with scientists. We always wanna do everything ourselves and come down as an umbrella scientist and save the day. But what we need to do is actively work with build capacity of the locals to do the restoration and to get my students to work with them so they get to understand another culture and bring it back to their culture. So those are the three elements that I see that are missing, right? That have been missing in our restoration approach for mangroves, but all restoration. So yeah, I'll leave it at that. Sorry if I went too long. No, no, absolutely. I mean, you know, all of your all of your points are uh, you gave me so much to kind of talk, you know, to, 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 to go further on. Um, but you know, I, I really, you know, your your point about inspiring, you know, going out and kayaking, experiencing and bringing your students there and and inspiring all of them to, 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 to think about what they can do and to take action. You know, Leo, I look at, you know, we're, we're at a film festival, right? And, and, the, and the, the mission and the kind of point of what we're trying to do at the International Ocean Film Festival is to, is to inspire activism through film and what, you know, however that, whatever that means, whether, and, you know, and we all know that activism can be a million different, million different, different ways, right? And so, you know, Leo, what do you kind of, envision what do you what do you what, what do you hope to inspire from from this from this film well i think i think this film is really um a bit of an introduction into the importance of mangroves in in, in thailand um you know looking at the threats and and uh, as jim mentioned you know the shrimp aquaculture which has been so devastating there especially in the 80s and 90s um and i think there were, I, I read a stat the other day since since 1975 it's, it's estimated that over half of thailand's mangroves were lost to shrimp farm conversion um and and you know and and and, and looking at obviously you know i have a huge connection with the mangrove action project and, and and the work that they do and it was really their methodology that really kind of inspired me to to, to get more involved you know um looking at nature and working with nature it seems so obvious but it's 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 really difficult unless unless you know the science you know um and through working with these communities and, and across different levels i mean we have um uh across the southern southern coast um on the andaman coastline there's there's 15 is it 15 demonstration sites so they're all quite small scale you know one to two hectares but um, you know, I've been to in in the film. You'll see you'll see some of the lo local communities with volunteers, sort of digging digging channels. And and once you've had some mangrove loss, you know, actually, if you if you connect up the hydrology, it's all to do with hydrology. And and if those are connected to the adjacent mangroves, um, you don't have to plant anything. And and one of these sites, the the site that you see in the film, actually, twelve different species of mangrove, um, you know, planted itself. Um, and I just find that fascinating, you know, when, in a world we talk about biodiversity as well. And, and, and when you see, you know, obviously a lot of people are doing really good projects as well, but I've seen monoculture plantations where it's a single species plantation. It's got nothing to do, you know, it's very non-reflective of a real healthy mangrove forest. And, and I think, you know, I'm not, I'm not a biologist and, and an expert in this, but I can imagine that, you know, when you, when you have all these different species and, 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 and the, the different root systems and, and it's creating all these different conditions for the little things, you know, the little forms of life, you know, that, that, that really kind of level up to the big stuff as well. You know, that's the sort of biodiversity that, that, you know, I really want to, you know, with the mangrove action project sort of inspire and I hope that it could really get integrated into um, some of the big large scale uh, restoration projects that, that are going on because you know I really believe that you know it would really enhance any project um, so so yeah. So this issue of scale I'd like to ask you know Jim and Jen you know how are you all looking at this issue of scale Jim you know Leo was talking about the mangrove action project and your efforts in Thailand and um, I'd like to hear kind of from your perspective, how, how, how is the Mangrove Action Project and, and your, your colleagues working on that? And then, you know, Jen, from, for, as a person who, you know, works in Indonesia and the Philippines and Costa Rica and, you know, all those other places, what is, has been your experience in having to, 
to look at this issue of scale and both actually doing the work, but more importantly, covering the cost, <laughs> you know, and paying for the work. Because we all know this is not going to be cheap, right? And there's and there's ways to 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 um, to get around that or to address that. And so, Jim, I'll start with you first. Maybe I can talk a little bit about you know. For us, the you know our mission really is scaling up CBMR, that approach to mangrove restoration, um, and the film was instrumental to that because we've been um, we learned from Robin Lewis. Um, we invited him to India 2006 to do the first training, and that's sort of where I first learned about it. We came back to Thailand and felt, I mean, to really understand this, we have to do it ourselves. So we did some small um, scale projects so we could learn by doing and understand the issues. Um, and then we started, yeah, this works. This actually really works. And so then we started, you know, going to conferences, talking to people, but, you know, it was the idea of a, of a film, a short film to get this idea to a much larger audience than we can ever reach out to. So that's, you know, the, where the video has played a very big role. And I mean, we wouldn't be here talking to you today, um, you know, if, if it wasn't for that video to reach out the ideas. And I think, um, you know, to upscale the ideas, this is why we've joined the, the Global Mangrove Alliance. You know, it's an international alliance. You know, if we can feed it, our ideas into the members, um, of that alliance who are doing restoration, um, we can have a global global impact. We're also a member of the IUCN Mangrove Specialist Group. It's a sort of a group of scientists, academics, uh, researchers, um, NGOs um, who are dealing with mangroves specifically. So through that organization as well, we we can reach reach out globally um, because as I mentioned, um, we're still seeing huge amounts of failure in restoration. Um, it really hasn't changed even here in Thailand. We've seen large scale government um, projects, um, planting on salt flats, you know, uh, you know, I could, um, I'm not sure, it, hard to fathom sometimes how these projects fail. Like why, why is the science, why is the past experience uh, not being learned um, where it should be? Yeah. So as I mentioned, you know, um, one of the future, I think, crux points to really upscale yeah. this, this methodology is it has to be a change in the forestry training schools throughout, throughout the region because Mangrove restoration mostly happens with governments. Governments are the agency who are doing mangrove restoration. They have the resources and the manpower and the control. Um, but all throughout the whole region, it's on, they've transferred sort of upland forestry plantation technique to the mangroves. And that has stayed sort of in the forestry school. So every graduate comes out, they're talking about nursery stock, spacing, um, you know, creating the perfect plantation and, you know, um, is, is their goal and, you know, that's success. For us, you know, we were trying to bring back that biodiversity that Leo has talked about, bring back the natural forest. So sometimes, you know, it's a really frustrating because we can bring a person to the site, our site, and it's, you know, naturally recovering multiple species, um, but there's no human evidence. There's not straight rows. So someone asks you, so what did you do? I mean, it doesn't look like we have have done anything on the site because we just have a natural mangrove growing. Um, so they don't see the human side of, um, other than the signpost, maybe that this is a restoration site. Um, so that is one of our difficulties. Um, I think it's human nature, humans love to plant, you know, gardening is probably the most popular hobby and people like to plant things. And we're not against planting. We feel small scale planting. We always do some planting to test the site, to make sure it's, um, it's ready 
for for uh, natural regeneration, but we really trying to get away from this monoculture plantation mentality. So um, I think the next major step would really to be changing curriculum within uh, forestry training schools throughout the region, which is a huge undertaking um, to get forestry to value biodiversity and not just green coverage if they're successful of, of sites. So that's um, you know where we'd really like to see CBMR going um, approach. And to you know the community part, most government projects also do not really involve communities other than maybe inviting them at the last stage and saying, help us put these seeds in the ground, but not really involving them in the decision that they feel that's, they, they, you know, local people will say that's government site. They, they, you know, that's their plant. It, that, so they feel that they have no uh, ownership, no interest uh, in that site. So the more the communities have ownership um, the more they value and the more they will protect anything illegal, something going wrong. They're the first ones who feel that they're being, um, something's being taken away from them. So they're the, de they're the defenders. And the livelihoods is another issue that we have to link to the local community to make them very strong in terms of um, protecting these sites in the long term. So we can maybe talk about livelihoods later on. Thank you. Thanks, Jim. You know, that, that point about, uh, about forestry curriculum, I hadn't even thought about that, to be honest, you know, I'm, my background is, is oceans. <laughs> um, so, you know, but I remember going to, to a country and, and learning that between their, their ministry, uh, their three different ministries, if you looked at a tree, there was the, the people that had, or had um, authority over the, the soil, over the trunk, and over the leaves, <laughs> they were three different three different ministries. And so shockingly, um, they were struggling <laughs> to 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 to, uh, to go forward. So so looking at kind of the basics, right? The beginning of, of a forest of a, a forestry staff member or colleagues education is 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 important as well. Um, Jen, you know, same question to you about the idea of scale and how to tackle scale um, in in from your sure. perspective. Sure. And I'll say that um, my role at Conservation International has really been to, to tackle that exact question. How are we going to scale uh, coastal conservation and restoration? How are we going to finance it? And, you know, I think in focusing, at least in my side or my, the hat I wear is really focusing on, you know, how do we um, use their climate mitigation and adaptation value to really drive investment into coastal conservation and restoration. And there are a couple of examples I would like to mention where we were able to go from sort of a small scale project to something very uh, national scale. Um, and, you know, for the first one, uh, it would be a project that we have been working on for the last two or three years in uh, Cispata, Colombia. So in that area, there is a mangrove uh, area that was being um, restored through hydrology uh, restoration to, to Jim's point and um, conserving it by working with the local communities that were basically uh, during dry season, uh, cutting mangroves down, draining the area and using it for cattle grazing. And we have a, a model that we call conservation agreements where we work very closely with local communities. It's a back and forth process where both sides are held accountable to you know, stopping deforestation, restoring the area, and then providing benefits back to the community, either in the form of uh, technical trainings, livelihood opportunities, um, and funding to go towards the management of the area. And in Cispata, uh, we are using blue carbon finance. So we're using those conservation restoration activities to um, create and, and to generate uh, carbon credits. So those are uh, credits that you can get issued based off of the climate mitigation values. So how much uh, CO2 is being removed because you um, restored a system. And so new trees are there and they're removing more carbon from the atmosphere. Or how many emissions did you avoid by stopping deforestation? Our project there over the lifetime of that project will 
generate about 1 million credits. And we are working with the local authorities, the national government and local communities to manage uh, that resource. And in that case, the financing is being, um, is going to be where the credits are sold on the voluntary market. So that would be open to international companies and other organizations interested in uh, purchasing carbon credits. And um, at a premium price because it's a premium product. And then um, the finances will go into a centralized fund that is managed by a local management team. And that funding is being earmarked specifically to support communities, to support the management and um, improvement of the marine protected area where the mangroves reside. The scaling aspect of that though, is that the Colombian government um, has been incredibly excited about this project. And they have already uh, uh, come to us as well as our partners on the ground to look at how we can expand it. So we're already looking to expand our current project to two new locations within the same Gulf, but the Colombian government wants to take it even further. They've seen that this can work, that communities are engaged. And so they actually want to replicate it in up to five additional locations throughout the country. They want to combine it with efforts around green gray infrastructure, where you have traditional engineering partnering with uh, ecological restoration um, to improve and restore uh, coastal systems. And, um, you know, that is the dream, right? That's you, you go, you do some, somewhat of a small scale project, but you show that it works and then the government gets excited and wants to really expand on it and they're supporting it uh, themselves. And, um, you know, we're all working together as a team, which is really fascinating and has been a great pleasure of, of the last few years of my career. The other example I wanna give, which is different, but also a, a example of scaling nationally is in Costa Rica. So in Costa Rica, in the Gulf of Nicoya, there's a small island there, Chira Island, and the women of that island have been uh, critical in the conservation and restoration of mangroves along their coast in the island. Similarly, they saw such um, amazing benefits from doing this that the government has taken notice. And so Costa Rica actually has a national payment for ecosystem service model. And traditionally that has been focused on terrestrial systems where if you're Costa Rican and you go to buy gas to fill up your car, some portion of the, of the money that you use to buy your gas goes into a centralized government fund that goes specifically towards conserving and restoring terrestrial systems. Sort of based off of the uh, mangrove restoration project in Chira, the benefits that was provided by that, along with some of the science and policy initiatives that CI and others have led, they're now starting to integrate in blue carbon and coastal ecosystems into this national process. And that's being designed now. And because of the benefits that they saw from some of these pilot projects uh, have created some of the most ambitious and forward looking uh, commitments under the Paris Agreement out of any country in the world when it comes to coastal ecosystems. And we're very, very proud of that. And I think the last thing I'll say about scaling is that I think that the general public, you know, if you're a student or you're somebody that's sitting there thinking, I really want to do something and I want to do something meaningful for this topic, but I'm not a mangrove ecologist. Awesome. Like, I think the thing that we need is multidisciplinary approaches. And so, you know, the projects I work with more and more, I'm relying on engineers, I'm relying on financial managers, I'm looking at people that understand investment portfolios, I'm looking at innovative um, production that's sustainable in these systems, because it can't just be on the backs of ecologists, it has to be also more people from more disciplines getting excited and interesting and interested in finding the way that their skill set can work towards environmental issues. And I think we're starting to see that more and more now. And it's really going to grow the field and it's going to provide innovation that I would never have saw coming previously. And that's very exciting. Great. Thanks, Jen. And Gretchen, I want to give you, you know, you and I chatted about this, I guess maybe a week and a half or so. I can't, time has no meaning anymore. But, but you and I talked about this and you're talking about, you know, biogeographic scales and, you know, thinking about 
um, some cool things that, that folks can do. And I know you were talking during our conversation about financing, about how to do what to do, how to, how to, how to tackle this, you know, this global issue, this global problem, this, these global efforts. And so I wanted to give you time and, and a space to come to, to, to chime in as well. Scale, <laughs> what to do with it. <laughs> so related to what um, Jen just had to say, I just wanted to mention, and then I'll answer your question, Nicole, is that I, I had this amazing experience this first semester teaching undergraduate students. I had 300 students at National University of Singapore in the geography department. And I, I was given the task of teaching a geomorphology class. And that is not my discipline. However, I have learned fluvial geomorphology and you know that's, so geomorphology is very important for mangrove restoration and so is hydrology, right? And, and, and so these are, physical aspects of the environment you have to learn. And they're not, they're, 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 they're very technical, right? And so instead of teaching from the slides that the professor that was on sabbatical gave to me, I decided to teach to my expertise, which is actually ecosystem restoration. And it was a class that was expanding on interdisciplinary gen. This class was, I had stu engineering students, I had business students, I had law students, I had a student in facilities management that made a video of his design. So anyway, so what I did is I um, decided that I was going to uh, figure out a way to teach 30 different disciplines, non-majors mostly, about ecosystem restoration. And it was through the platform of river restoration, which Singapore is starting to do. Um, and it's connected to mangroves. So they had a bunch of students that work on mangrove projects as well at the estuary, right? At the um, interface of the, um, the sea um, and, and land. So I had 150 students in small groups working on these project interdisciplinary projects. Um, and I was just blown away by the projects they came up with. They, we went on a field trip together, socially distanced, to learn about this amazing project in Singapore. And then they did their own projects based on that. They picked um, a river restoration or mangrove restoration project in Singapore and went to it a couple of times with their groups. And this is mid pandemic. We're doing like field stuff with these students, but on their own, right? In the middle of the pandemic. Well, these interdisciplinary teams came up with ideas that Professor Lu Shishi and I hadn't thought about, right? And this is our field. And I invited this professor to come watch and we were blown away by what interdisciplinary teams can do. And this is the next generation, you guys. So I'm gonna continue teaching like this um, after the pandemic because I think it works, it's platform thinking. Um, and then to answer the scaling up, that is kind of scaling up, right? We're training all these different um, engineers and uh, let's see who are like some of the, the management people, right? The business people um, and, and we had social work, we had sociologists, every discipline in here. And so we're teaching them about the value of ecosystems, even though it was supposed to be this geomorphology course. Um, so that's what the Uni National University of Singapore is actually doing as of next year. We are becoming very interdisciplinary in our College of Humanities and Sciences. And so we're, we're taking, at least in Southeast Asia, the forefront on teaching our students how to work in these interdisciplinary teams, tackling problems like mangrove restoration. Um, so I'm really excited to be a part of this. Um, and I've, I've actually gotten to talk to the president about it. And we're all really excited to also engage the community. So we're, we're getting um, really excited about doing social justice projects here, you know, working with communities. And that's what I wanted to end on because that was your question, Nicole. Sorry, I wanted to follow up on what Jen had to say first. Um, is that I have a great example from Lombok, Indonesia of a group that I've been working with um, for many years, but this is a new project. And um, SOURCE, which I just, I wanted to look up the acronym, the Sustainable Ocean Research, Conservation and Education um, Initiative just built a field station pre-pandemic. And uh, we went there and visited in July, 2019, luckily, just before the pandemic happened. Um, and, 
And all these organizations that are trying to do community-based restoration with tourists and eco-tourists and voluntourists and interns and students are really suffering right now. And the communities are suffering and that's leading to poaching and cutting down of mangroves. And so it's been a really weighing heavy on my heart right now as, um, as an ecologist and someone that wants to do really innovative restoration work. And so what we have come together to work on with my students were really instrumental in this, doing online meetings with this organization um, and working with the community and the government of Indonesia. And, and, and they got lucky in this amazing new app from the UK called the Tree App. Um, I don't know, Leo can get it because he's in the UK. They haven't gone global yet, but it's a really neat app that basically you can go and plant a tree for free. Um, and so this is the first mangrove restoration project that they're working with. And, and we're going through the process of getting approved right now. We're in the final stages. But one thing in the application that was really interesting was, do you have any other objectives other than plantation or planting plantations. And I just thought the same as Jim, this is got to get away from plantation plantings, right? And so I just um, elaborated um, on the ecosystem and the community-based efforts. And we're actually linking mangroves, it's called roots to reefs, and we link mangroves to seagrass beds and to coral reefs. Um, and they're, we're doing restoration in all three of those ecosystems and researching the connection between the three. So this is also um, about scale, that the question of scale you're asking about. But what I think more importantly is the funding aspect of it. And they're struggling to even survive there because they don't have any uh, revenue from tourism. And what the Tree App and other really unique um, platforms like that are doing is allowing these nonprofit organizations to connect with the government and the communities who are really eager to make money other than just uh, shifting agriculture and, and overfishing their resources because their populations are growing. So, so what's really exciting is this tree app connected with um, B Corps, so sustainable corporations who are funding them through advertisements. And so what you do is you get on the tree app and you watch one video from a really cool sustainable organization. Um, and then that they plant a tree. Um, so that money goes to um, all these organizations around the world and you get to learn about all these unique organization, organizations. So hopefully MAP will get involved as well. But we're the first mangrove um, planting organization. And I, truly believe that you cannot plant until you get, um, and we've, we've seen this for 30 years in ecology and ecological restoration. You can't plant a place unless it's the right area with the right hydrology and the right geomorphology. So basically to all non-scientists listening right now, you, you, you gotta get the elevations, the levels right. If you're planting too low, your plants are gonna be underwater. If you're planting too high, they're gonna dry out. And so we're in this unique ecosystem somewhere between the ocean um, and land, and we got to get that. We got to get that part of it right. Um, and so, then just to end, um, Nicole, is that the real scaling up and learning, like Jim was talking about, is going to happen through communities helping to not only protect those mangroves that are planted or plant themselves, but to monitor the success of projects like the Tree App is planting. Because if we don't monitor what's actually been planted or, or restored on its own passively, then we have no idea what's working and what's not working. And we got to learn from these experiences and I'll just leave it at that. So thank you. Sorry thank if I went you. too long. <laughs> thank you. And, and before I'm going to, Jim, I'm going to go over to you since everybody is mentioning communities and you want to chat about, and Gretchen talked about, you know, income and you want to talk about livelihood. Before I do, we have about 10 more minutes. Um, and I didn't say this before, but um, if you have questions, please put them in put them in the live stream chat. Um, where, you know, let's get our get our get our panelists to to pick. We have an opportunity to pick their brains and um, and, uh, and 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 hear the answers. So please add, please put your questions in, and, and we'll get them asked. Um, but Jim, um, 
you know, we're hearing all about, uh, you know, Gretchen was talking about the impact of tourism or lack thereof during the pandemic. You know, you mentioned that you wanted to chat to, to reference or to talk a little bit about livelihoods. I'd love to hear your thoughts about, you know, what that means to you and, 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 um, and you know, in your experience and, and, and Jen as well, you know, with the, with the Costa Rica with ladies and Costa Rica example for, you know, um, in Colombia as well. So Jim. Well, we found that uh, the livelihood is very, very important um, for local people. And if you offer some livelihood incentives, this will provide the long-term protection of the mangroves. Um, so I think it's just not us, but I think many, many uh, people who have worked with communities, um, many communities are very poor. Um, and you know, people expect them to spend a lot of time working on a restoration site or doing other conservation work where they have daily food needs. And um, if they, you know, they have to give up um, time from their own income generation, which is, uh, you know, meager often, um, they don't have savings, um, that they need to have some livelihood incentive. And if you have seen the video or if you haven't, in there is uh, one example that I think has become um, a, really a model for us, and it's the apiculture um, that is in Nainung community. Um, this community had observed, I mean, they were in, always in the mangroves, they observed bees um, pollinating uh, different species, and they started to record, you know, different species. They, they noticed bees pollinating. Um, they, uh, the bees they've noticed, I mean, they, they nest in their houses, around their houses, in their sheds. Um, so they were very familiar with the, with the, the, the wild native bee, uh, Apis serrata. Um, so they thought more about this, that, um, um, you know, a possibility of um, raising these bees in uh, hives, boxes, to um, generate, you know, to produce honey. Um, so MAP has helped them, you know, took them on study tour to visit a government apiculture center. They brought back one box, um, uh, apiculture uh, box. They, you know, they started to build a few of them. They used old wood from old fishing boats, recycled it, built boxes, set them out. Um, and these were colonized. Some of them were colonized by bees. Um, and then they transferred them back to near their houses so they could look after them. And that sort of really started um, an interest. And it's really sort of grown where the, the community now has a, about 1,200 um, boxes they've set out. About 800 of those are colonized uh, by wild bees. And it's really been... Um, a win-win-win um, type of uh, scenario for this for this livelihood because all the group members agreed from the beginning that they would not use any pesticide. Most of them also have uh, other agricultural crops, so they all agreed to use no pesticide because they knew insecticides, particularly, would be um, devastating to to the bees. Um, so that was a another win for the community. But they started producing, you know, raw, natural um, honey um, and selling it. And um, then there's not much honey produced at first. So they thought, you know, they learned. We took them on another study tour to a government center. And they learned, particularly the women's group, learned how to make products from the honey. So they started making, as you will see in the video, um, shampoos, lotions, uh, uh, balm, lip balm, um, uh, a number of products. And those became a really good source of income year round because this wild bee only they harvest usually once a month or once a year, about this time of year, there's harvest season. But the products that they're selling could really um, add value and raise income throughout the year, particularly by the women's group. Um, so the we found that this has been so successful that um, we've had a little bit of funding. Now they're going to other communities, doing their own training, training of trainers 
of uh, in other communities without our help. Basically, they're all, all you know, uh, have their own training program. They have a training fees they have established. So they're generating income now by, by trainers themselves. Um, the building of the, the bee box themselves, they have found, well, there's big demand throughout the country for these and the communities they're training. So it's actually become the second source of income um, is now selling, selling the, 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 the bee boxes uh, to other communities. So we have found, you know, they, they say to us, the community says, you know, the more bees there are, the more mangroves there will be, the healthier they'll be because there's more pollination going on, which means more honey, which means more income. So uh, it's, you know, it's a, it's a, it's a win, win, win type of uh, livelihood that takes also pressure off the mangroves. Uh, you know, they don't have to be going and ex extracting resources um, because now they have generated income. They've also set up the conservation fund. So 10% of all the products they sell go into the community fund, which is used for conservation and community social welfare. So um, I think this is a good model to replicate in, in other communities um, um, to really get that long-term sustainable buy-in to, to conservation because it linked directly to the coastal resources. Um, people often maybe introduce livelihoods that do not directly connect to, to nature. And so those lose some of the ability to instill the conservation uh, need uh, locally to protect the resource. Um, so do see the video um, and um, uh, think about apiculture as, because we know worldwide the importance of bees as pollinators um, for food, for uh, many of our, our crops and bees are suffering because of loss of habitat loss of, uh, because of the great use of, uh, of uh, chemical uh, pesticides. Thank you Thanks. for that. Um, and Jen, we, we have a couple more minutes, but um, I'd, I'd love to hear some of your, your thoughts. I, um, I know one of our, so I don't know if I said this before, but full disclosure, um, I also work for Conservation International and Jen, Jen and I are colleagues. Um, yeah. And so one of our colleagues uh, once said, you know, it's, it's, it's all, you know, no one's gonna care about mangroves unless you, sorry. <laughs> um, no one's gonna care about mangroves if they have to worry about feeding their kids, right? So, um, you know, talking about generating income, sending them to school, things like that. So Jen, if you have any, any thoughts? Yeah, I mean, I just want to first agree with everything Jim said. I think that the bees are a really great alternative livelihood. You know, we have, we're trying now to document actually how much fisheries improvement comes with every hectare of mangrove uh, restored, both within the mangrove and offshore as far as uh, fishing effort and abundance, which is a big thing. The, the one thing though that I'll add, because I think Jim did such a great job about uh, the livelihoods is that there is a lot of competition. This is a area there where the opportunity cost is very high. So tourism brings in a lot of money um, and everybody wants beachfront property. Um, and, you know, as just one example. So I think that where we're going to need to start to think and where I'm starting to think as well is how do you start to combine protection and conservation with sustainable production such that you can have something that can compete in a way with some of these more, um, unfortunately, profitable uh, land uses. And I think that they exist. And I think that the beneficiaries of each one of those, um, of course, are different. Like the larger scale industry benefits a very different group than the local communities. And you need to be able to balance that. But again, thinking about how the private sector can engage in a sustainable way that supports communities. I don't know what that answer is right now, which is why I think that interdisciplinary approach is, is needed. But um, yeah, I think that for me, it's, it's about, you know, livelihoods and, you know, the small scale livelihoods all the way up to something that could be, um, you know, a competitive opportunity for communities, you know, that is also sustainably done. 
Well, thank you for that. You know, it's it's a it's a it's a really good point. You know, you, we're not the only game in town, right? So the and and if you're talking about all the different pressures and, and increasing pressures that communities around the world living on coast, living on beachfront, beachfront properties, you know, um, even though even though sea levels are rising, people still want to live on the beach. So it's, it's, it's not that much of a deterrent. It's only increasing. And so um, it's always important to keep in mind that, you know, again, we're not the only game in town to deal with a lot of pressures. And so really to be aware and recognize and respectful of that and, and community needs um, and, and, and kind of the approach. And when you're when 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 we as a as a community, as an industry and a sector kind of work and, and try to attain all these goals. Um, we are at the hour, actually a little, a little bit over the hour. Um, so I wanna thank all of you and thank Leo for a fantastic film and Jim for, um, for, for appearing in the film, but also for, for giving your, you know, your community level kind of expertise. Um, Jen, you know, looking at trying to navigate that, that UN, I can't even think about it, <laughs> you know, space right now watching the, watching the climate climate change summit going on right now. Um, and Gretchen, you know, you're teaching the next generation of, of, of all of these different folks and coming up with really amazing ways to teach folks that have business degrees and engineering. And so I wanna thank all of you all and our audience um, for joining us today and, um, and enjoy the rest of the film festival. And I hope you enjoy what, 80, more than 80 films across all different kinds of of topics and issues and challenges and, and just amazing parts to be able to, opportunities to see our ocean. Um, and, and with that, thank you everyone and have a good rest of the day and weekend. Thank you. Thanks so much. Thank you. Thanks so much.